Patrick Stevenson writes an article for Faith and Practice in August of 15, 2018. And in that article, he uh, talks about the top 10 things Americans worship and shouldn't. The top 10 things Americans worship and shouldn't. In that article, he went on to talk about 71% of people in the United States of America proclaim to believe in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is deity, Jesus Christ, who is the atoning substitute who died on Calvary's cross for the remission of our sins. 71% of people who reside in the United States of America according to Stevenson, believes that Jesus Christ is truly the only way to God. And in light of that fact, you would think it would impact the beliefs, what people value, what people worship, what people give honor to. And in that article, he lists 10 things, but I want to show you the top three things that he lists, beginning with the third as the top 10 things that people worship. First thing he put was one that I was surprised. I thought it would be in the number one spot, but it was number three, and he said money. Money, money, money. He said number three is money, that uh, we love money in America because money symbolizes power. Money gives us a level of prestige, a level of control, Money is like a drug because it is a sedative that sometimes sedate us into believing and thinking that if we have money, that we have a sufficiency for whatever we need. That money is going to solve and be the solution to our problems. And so what do we worship? What do we value? We value money, money. Second thing he put on that list was the state, the state. If you look in the United States of America, we value where we're from. We value being American. Uh, we value a lot of things that are associated with America, fiercely devoted, millions upon millions. We sing the hymnals of God bless America, the Star Spangled Banner, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, all of those things we sing that demonstrates our allegiance and our devotion to America. Even to our state, Texas, the flags and all of those things. Canonized sainthood individuals like Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Lincoln and Roosevelt, etc. I don't know who all they interviewed, but... I'm just telling you what the article said. He said, we worship the state. We worship the country, where we're from. A lot of times, people who we know and friends, I know when I was, I was in camp sometimes when I was younger, we would know people by the city where they're from or the state. We didn't call them by their name. We would call them by the city they're from. Why? Because... There's allegiance to it. It's important to us. Where are you from? Your home, your significance. And so what do we do? We worship this. We put a premium value on those things. But the number one thing that he said we worship, above all, is the self. The self. He says self is in the number one spot of what we as citizens of the United States of America worship. He said it's the self. Because we are consumed with the self. Whenever you look at a picture and you are on that picture, who's the first person you look at on that picture? Man, did they get my best side? I should have been, they didn't get the best side. Well, I might need to shed a few pounds. That, that wasn't a good. We look at the self. Amen? Some of you are laughing because you know it's the truth. Whenever you look at that picture, you're looking at yourself and you want to see how do you appear. We are selfish by nature. We come here selfish. As babies, the baby come in crying and screaming, feed me, feed me, coddle me, coddle me, pick me up, hold me, embrace me. 
selfish. We are born that way, shaped that way, and we remain that way until God comes in and asks us to rearrange our priorities. God asks us to shift and make an adjustment in the priorities of what we worship. And he says, I don't want you in number one. I don't want your state in number two. And I don't want your money in number three. He said, I want you to shift those things down and elevate me to the number one spot. He says, I want to be the sole entity that you worship. <laughs> Hear me? And impact my question to you this morning is, who and what do you worship? Exodus chapter 12 is a great text because in Exodus chapter 12, it's the context of the Peshah, the Passover. The Passover is about to take place, the first, the institution of the Passover. This is very significant for so many reasons because it, it culminates all of the signs that God had performed through Moses in Egypt. Pharaoh refused to let the people of Israel go. And so God performed all these signs. But you got to understand why God performed these signs. And I want you to stay with me this morning. We won't be long, but I want you to stay with me. God was performing these signs because he had to prepare Israel when they would leave Egypt so that they would have the confidence to know that he was a God that was worthy to be praised and a God that they could trust. Is it anybody in here who really know that you can trust God, that he's a worthy God, he's a good God? I, I'm not talking about something you read, but because by your virtue of your life, by virtue of your experiencing and living, you have come to the conclusion, you have solidified it in your mind. There is no doubt that you know that God is a good God faithful, worthy. He can sustain you and keep you regardless of what happens in your life. Anybody there yet? Raise your hand if you're there. Yeah. There's a few of us who have come to that position where we're like, I know God holds me and keeps me and he is guiding me through whatever I will encounter in this thing called life. Because a lot of people haven't come to that place. God had to reassure the nation of Israel because they were in Egypt. Egypt symbolized a place of captivity and bondage. They were shackled, they had physical, but also they had a mental level of bondage that they existed in. And God had to prepare them for worship. When he was going to deliver them from Egypt, he had to get them ready for what they were going to encounter because you have to understand that if you've been living so many years promoting the self, the state, and money, and all those ancillary items that follow, that you don't automatically begin to worship God and put him first. You don't do it. It requires a level of cultivation. It requires a level of transformation to get to the place where you really worship God and God alone. And so what does he do? He does these plagues. God had sent Moses and Aaron before Pharaoh because he was holding them captive. Symbolically here, almost like Satan himself. Egypt was referencing the territory of bondage, holding them captive. And God wants to deliver them. God does this final miraculous event. You got to see this. And so what does he do? He had them to kill the lamb to celebrate Passover and they are to put the blood over the doorposts of the home. Paint the blood over the doorpost. That blood symbolized the atonement, kafar, the covering over. He covered over not only their sins, but also he protected them because when the death angel come through, that death angel would see the blood over the doorpost and it symbolized being protected, shielded by the blood that was shed. And some of us see that even in a New Testament context. How God has not put it over the doorposts of our homes, but God has put it over the doorposts of our hearts. Anybody got the blood over their heart this morning? Anybody in here can say, Roche, I've been covered. I, I got it over my doorposts. I got it on my door. I got it on everything that concerned me. I put the blood. I'm covered in the blood. 
Why was he doing this? He was letting them know, I got you covered. He said, I got you covered, Israel. The firstborn is going to die. And God wanted Israel to know that I'm the one who's covering you. When that death angel comes through and he kills the firstborn in all those homes that don't have the blood over them, but only Israel, those with the blood over the doorposts are protected. It sends a message. Listen to me. They recognize what just happened was only by the hand of a sovereign God. Because there could be two homes on the same avenue, on the same block, boulevard, street. One family, firstborn dies, next family with the blood, son is preserved. What caused the dichotomy? It was nothing but the blood. And it sends a message to those individuals, God can be trusted because he is worthy. Therefore, we need to honor him in the capacity of worship. God was getting them ready because God knew that once he delivered them, he wanted them to do something. And the one thing that he wanted them to do was to worship. You and I must understand that when God delivers you, that it demands worship. Anybody know that? Deliverance demands worship. I'm convinced with a crowd this size, people watching us by live stream, somebody can attest to the fact that somewhere along the line, God delivered them from something. So often we are looking for the large events. That which caused the ground to shake. To recognize it as God's hand. But let me tell you something, even in the fact that you are here today sitting in a seat, the fact that you're watching us by live stream, the fact that you hear my voice means that God has delivered you from something. And when you have been delivered, it demands that you worship God and you give him the glory that he deserved because you didn't deliver yourself. It was God who delivered you. Deliverance demands worship. You got to understand that worship is something that's very important to God. God wants us to worship him. It's important. It's not a trivial matter. And so often in the context of the ecclesia, I'm convinced that we diminish the value and the significance of worship. The Bible talks too much about it. The very reason he tells Israel, I want want them to come out. He said, I want them to come out and go worship me. Interesting term he used in verse 31 for worship in the Hebrew is evdu, comes from Evdri. And and the term has this idea of to serve, to do work. But also in the nominative, it talks about meaning you bow down and pay homage to and honor. With certain words, it also has this idea of to prostrate, to lie, extend oneself in a ground context. What he wanted them to do was when they come out, once they have been delivered, he says, Israel, I need you to serve me. I need you to worship me. And it has this idea also of to cultivate something. In all of their worshiping, there should be a cultivation of this relationship whereby they understand the value and the worth of God. That's what worship is. To worship means to attribute worth or value to something. The Bible talks about two things so often. And I'm telling you, I want you to see this praise and worship. Look at this. You got to understand that praise is the verbal. Watch this pronouncement. Praise is a verbal pronouncement. Whenever we you have praise, if you're going to have true praise, you're going to have to use the vocal cords. Praise requires you to open your mouth and for you to have an utterance. There should be something that proceeds from the mouth when you have authentic praise. And God demands that we praise him. Enter his courts with what? And praise. He wants us to come in with thanksgiving, praising him, and saying, well, God, you are worthy. It comes from the mouth. He don't want us to come inside. That's why he says, shout unto the Lord. Why? 
because God wants to hear our verbal affirmation. He says, let the redeemed say so. And if you have truly been a recipient of the goodness of God every now and then, you need to let him know. I know some of us have been raised in different contexts. I realize that. Your worship experience, how you were raised in certain churches, very different. Some of us have been raised in church where we just kind of come and we sit. We nod and we give, yeah, it's good. And we write a note or two and we, yeah, it's good. Yeah. We don't get too exercised. We don't get too excited. We stay kind of calm. And when somebody gets a little excited, we start looking around like, they okay? <laughs> Maybe we should get them some water. They need a fan. Something happen. <laughs> it's your experience. And oftentimes your experience dictates for probably the rest of your life, how you would worship your experience as a child. It's amazing how much of our childhood form and mold us, especially before 12 years of age, how much it forms and mold and shape the rest of our lives, our ideology, how we understand things. And some of us have come from maybe a Pentecostal background. We're more expressive. If you don't shout or say something, they're like, hey, we're going to be in here till we get a shout. Some of us are like, hey, let's go and shout so we can get out of church. Say something, somebody. Some of us understand. Anybody know? You, you understand? Different contexts. And some of us are somewhere in between. We are hybrid. Whatever your context or your experience, I'm convinced of one thing, that if God has truly been gracious and God has delivered you, that you should learn to worship God and there should be praise that emanate from your mouth. Are you all with me? Everybody loves praise. Even the dog responds different when you praise him. Pat him one time and give him a treat. He'll go to jumping up on you, licking, wagging his tail. Hey, hey, I like this. This is good. All of us want praise, and so does our God. And God wants the verbal pronouncement, utterance. And let me tell you something, saints. If God has done it every now and then, there should be the verbal proclamation, the pronouncement of the goodness of our God. The other thing that goes along with that is something called worship. Worship is the mental posture. Stay with me, stay with me, because this is important. When we talk about worship, we're talking about a mindset. What do you think about God, what do you think about that which is important? Because it has to begin in your mind that you attribute a value to it, a medium, a price. And so when it comes to worship, what we're saying is, what do I think about God? That's worshiping God. Because we already know what people think about money. When it comes to money, we know how we value it. People will kill, fight for money for their state, for their allegiance, for their devotion to America. And then for the self, we know what we do for the self-preservation, number one. But what is your thinking when it comes to your God? Does your God cause you to have the mental posture of bowing down and worship, serving him, and daily cultivating a lifestyle whereby you are attributing value to him, you are honoring him, and you are saying you are worthy, God, to receive honor, glory, majesty, and dominion? What is your mental posture toward God? Our posture tells a whole lot about what we're thinking. One of the things I do all the time when I'm speaking, I watch people's posture. Are they like this? Are they like this? Are they like this? What are they doing? Because it tells me whether I'm connecting. It tells me whether you are receiving what I'm saying. You communicate more with your posture than you think. I was reading one article about posture. It was saying that if there's someone that you like, you have a tendency to turn your feet toward them when you are speaking with them. Because oftentimes your facial expression, you will change because you don't want the person you're speaking with to know what you're thinking. But when you adjust your posture, it reveals a lot more than you think. 
Though you may change your facial expression, your posture would tell. And so if my feet are directed away from you, but I'm talking to you, it might suggest I really don't want to be bothered with you. I'm being nice. But I really don't like you. But when my feet, as well as my face, they're turned toward you, I'm communicating, I'm interested, I'm a recipient, I'm receiving what you have to say. I'm convinced the same can be said about our God. Our posture, whether we are on our knees praying, whether we are standing with outstretched arms and hands, whether we are lifting a hand up toward him, whether we are saying something about God and how we value him by the posture that we assume mentally. Watch. Before you can get to the praise, you have to have the mental posture of worship. The mental posture is the internal component that gives you the capacity to express the external component, which is praise. If your mental is not right, if you are not truly worshiping God, you probably definitely won't praise him. Because it has to begin in the mind to tell you that God has been good and you see it. And then you say, Lord, thank you before you know it, because God has already done it for you. While I was away, I was flying from Cairo to London. I don't really like to fly anyway. I have to do it, do it all, you know, so much. And I, I don't really like those long flights. But, I, you know, I just, you have to do it. It's just part of the, what you got to do to travel. Just, it is what it is. And so we're coming back from Cairo. We get to Heathrow. And you know how it is, 20 minutes before you land. Okay, we want you seats upright and everybody put away your tray tables and moving objects in front of you. Then they tell the flight attendants, let flight attendants prepare for landing and so you can sit down and so everybody's prepared and you get yourself mentally prepared to land, right? And so I'm ready, you know, clear, I'm going to put my computer up, stop studying, so I'm getting ready. Landing and taking off is the hardest part of flying for me. I'm pretty good once we get up there, the altitude, we're cruising, I'm good. Don't like those two states. We're approaching Heathrow and the plane begins to descend. Coming down. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I'd be so glad when this plane get on this tarmac and land so I can get off this bad boy. I got one more flight. I'd be in Houston good. As we are approaching and descending and getting close to the tarmac, all of a sudden I felt a little jolt. Mm. Like, ugh. That ain't good. We get a little lower, and all of a sudden, we're about to land, and he throttles the plane. Instead of descending, we begin to ascend. And I'm thinking to myself, this can't be good. <sighs> Swallow hard. I looked to my right. It was a girl over there, and she was flush. It was silence on the plane. Nobody saying a word, hardly kind of looking around like, hmm. Captain doesn't come on. I'm like, hey, doc, you can you kind of just let us know what's going on. It's going to be good to hear from you right about now. We go up, man, we're going on up. I can tell, you know, we're going up. And all of a sudden, then we just, then we begin to kind of circle. Ten minutes later, he comes on. Hey, we were approaching and we couldn't land. The headwind was 100 miles per hour, and we couldn't land, and so we're going to have to make another circle around and try to land again. Girl next to me, she was looking, but she was struggling. But I was struggling too. <laughs> and so Roche had to get in front of Tyrone and tell him, son, relax and trust God on this one. God is good. You're always talking about trusting him. You got to trust God in this situation. This is an occasion where you got to trust him. So I'm talking to myself like, man, relax and be cool. Believe God got you. I believe God has some more work for you. God got you. He's going to get you there. I'm talking to myself and I'm praying through this thing. You all hadn't been there. If you hadn't been there, you know what I'm talking about. But I'm praying through this thing to myself and coming myself down and saying, you got to trust him in this situation. We make our next approach. We're descending, get there, boom, flawless landing. I was like, man, 
I looked over, I saw the girl, she grabbed her phone telling everybody, oh man, we landed, and she began to describe what happened. She was on the phone telling her friend, I raised my hand up and said, Lord, thank you for getting us now for coming them wins. I said, you can call on your friends. I'm calling on the one who's come those 100 miles per hour winds and got us on this tarmac. Call your friends all you want. I can tell them later. I want to thank the one who I know who holds me in his hand. Do y'all hear me? I thank God for the expertise of the pilot, his training, for his wisdom. I thank him for it. But let me tell you something. If those wind were 200, we wouldn't have gotten, wouldn't have made it. I don't care what expertise. And that's why we have to learn to cultivate this idea and attitude of worship. Because let me tell you something, the turbulent winds are going to blow in life. And sometimes it doesn't land. And sometimes you don't just circle for 10 minutes. You circle for hours. You circle for days. You circle for months. You may circle for years. And God might not allow it to land. But even while you are circling, you have to learn to praise God and worship him and give him the glory that he deserves. Somebody know what I'm talking about. No matter where you are, you say, God, I'm going to praise you and worship you because I realize that you are worthy, God, to be worshiped. Israel had to get to the place where they could understand this. They had to get to that place. God had to prepare them to worship him. See, they were in bondage and they had all of these years of being steeped in a sinful, idolatrous, perverse, and wicked context. And now all of a sudden God says, I'm moving you, I'm transitioning, I'm taking you out of bondage. And when God delivered them, he want them to know that they should worship him. But you got to understand, the deliverance wasn't immediately, it was delayed. It was delayed. And oftentimes God does that. Why was it delayed? Because God had to demonstrate to them that he was someone they could trust. You don't come to the Lord immediately knowing that you can trust him. Anybody can attest to that? Anybody know? It takes time walking with God. Anybody tell you what the first day I was trusting him completely? Let me tell you something. I, I doubt it. Because the Christian life is truly sanctification. It's the journey. And as you walk with God, as you understand and comprehend him, God take you through various terrain and seasons whereby you have to trust him at different levels. At different levels. That's the thing that I'm, I'm learning. I, I received a call this week from someone in their 70s. And, and they called me and they were really upset about something that was going on within their family. And when I got the call, it, it did, it, it bothered me a little bit in this regard. You know, we want to believe that as we grow older in life that the years will allow us to mature and come to a place of comfort and assurance in God. You, you all with me? You, you all hear what I'm saying? Yeah. But every season of life brings a different level of challenges. And, and that's just the reality. And every challenge brings a different level of maturity that's required to address that challenge. You don't come with all of the tools to handle every season that you encounter. You have to grow. You have to grow to that season. And so I'm listening and I was thinking to myself when I got off the phone, I was like, Lord, how can I prepare when I get to that season? Because it's coming if you grant me grace. It's coming. How do I prepare to encounter those different seasons that I'm going to embark upon in a matter of time. And I'm convinced that's the one thing happened here with Israel. God had to have a pre-worship experience for them, for them to prepare to worship him once they left Egypt. There has to be a preparation that happens so that when you get there, you are ready. You're not waiting. And this is what's going to happen with Israel. When they come out of Egypt, when they find themselves in this wilderness, it's going to be totally different from what they, anything they've ever encountered. Because now they're free, and now they're going to have to deal with the 
challenges of the terrain, the challenges of themselves, and also the leadership that Moses and Aaron is going to provide. And so what has had to happen here is they have to prepare themselves for what is happening by number one, knowing that they can trust God. How is that applicable to you? You and I have to make certain that we don't wait till we get to church on a Sunday morning and say, okay, now I'm coming in here and I'm getting prepared to praise and worship God. There needs to be a pre-worship, pre-praise, pre-preparation that happens on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday, on Sunday morning, before you enter into the sanctuary collected to the praise and worship, you should already have been preparing and getting ready for what happens collectively on a Sunday morning. Why is that? Because if you're not preparing then, collectively, you are not adding anything to the praise and worship experience. You are a taker. You're not giving. I'm convinced the ecclesia gathers together, yes, to mutually benefit one another, and we are equipped and edified. But God also expects you to bring something to give when you come to the worship experience that somebody around you can benefit from your praise, benefit from your worship, and benefit from your experience and your time in communion with God. Don't, don't wait for the praise and worship leader to lead you and usher you in. Usher yourself in right there in the presence of your home, right there in your car, right there in your office, right there in your cubicle, right there wherever you serve, wherever you're working. Usher into the presence of a holy God and praise him and give him the glory that he so richly deserves. You got to prepare yourself. Here it is. Israel couldn't go because it was delayed. It was delayed. Why was it late? Pharaoh didn't want to let them go. Did not want to let them go. And you and I have to understand that even though it's delayed, that it still must not deter your worship. Anybody know that? Just because you're not where you want to be, you haven't gotten there yet, haven't experienced all you want. Listen, you should not cease to worship God. Because it is just a temporary place that God has you in. It's not permanent. I was on my way when I was getting ready to come back. I had to go to the airport there in Cairo. And so on my way, I was driving up and I was thinking, I was like, you know what? I'm excited. I'm kind of ready to get home. Got stuff I really need to get done. And as I was driving up to the airport, I was thinking about how the airport is just a temporary connecting spot. That's all it is. And I was driving, I was thinking, it's just temporary. I won't have to be there long. I knew I had about an hour and a half layover. I'm going to have to wait before the plane. We board and everything. But I knew. I said, it's only temporary. I walk in the airport, and I saw about 10, 12 guys laying on the floor, like had towels, or made their little bed, and they had some, their luggage like was their pillow. And I was like, man, what is going on? And I'm thinking to myself, what happened? The airport was never designed to be an extended stay. The airport is only a place where I go and connect that will take me to my destiny. Why are they stretched out laying out on the floor? They're laying there because for whatever reason their flight is delayed. But even with their flight being delayed, by the fact that they're laying on tiles, makeshift beds, luggage for their pillow, that lets me know that they also know that this is just temporary. Won't be here long. I'm just going to come here and connect for a little period of time, maybe an hour and a half. It may be 24 hours, maybe 40. But nevertheless, I know that I'm only here for just a temporary brief moment, and then I'm going on to my destiny. Let me tell you something. Some of you Maybe in a season of your life where you feel like you're in the airport and you're waiting on your flight, you're waiting on your next connection. But the one thing you have to rest and be assured of is this, is that God has already promised that he's going to get you to the destination. While you are there in the airport of whatever situation you're in, learn to worship God and give him praise. 
Worship him right there because you got to know I'm just here in this situation for a little while. I'm not going to be here forever. And so I'm going to worship him right here where I am. Even though I'm held up, I'm delayed. It is not denied. I'm going to the destiny because God has already decreed and promised it. Sometimes the delay make us not worship. We don't give him the value because we begin to think that he is not worthy. But let me tell you something. That's why he did the 10 plagues to let you know that he's worthy. And that's why you're in the holding pattern. You got to decide to worship God while you're delayed. Many of us aren't worshiping. What are you worshiping this morning? What are you worshiping? God told him, said, I need you to get ready. We're going to go worship. I like it here because even though it's delayed, God had finally convinced Pharaoh that he is truly God. There's no rivals. I like this. Look, look, look. God convinced him of it and God wanted him to know that he couldn't compete with him. I like this because in Psalms 34, great psalm, great psalm, beautiful psalm. Oh, man, run there with me real quick. I got to show you this. Won't take but a sec. In Psalms 34, I want you to see it because David found himself delayed. If you recall, David had been anointed by Samuel to be king of Israel. But David was running from Saul. In his fleeing for his life, David encounters Abimelech. Abimelech knew who David was and Abimelech should have killed David. But what David does is when he encounters Abimelech, David pretends that he has lost his mind. He's groveling, drooling, and he's pretending like he, he, he's lost his sanity, his acumen, his ability to comprehend and understand things. And they're looking at him and they're thinking David is out of his mind. He's crazy. He's lost his mind. And so they see him feigning madness and so David is before his enemy who should have killed him and Saul is chasing him. And as David is between these two enemies, he pretends to be crazy so that he can get delivered. Psalms 34 is written in that context. And look what David says. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. Watch this, because I don't think y'all see it. Here this man is could potentially be killed. He pins a sum that talks about even when his life is at stake, he could potentially be killed by Abimelech or Saul. He said, it doesn't matter where I am. He says, I'm still going to learn to bless the Lord at all times. This is not for the faint of heart because you have to work, cultivate, and grow to the place where you can say, I can worship God even when my life is on the line. He says, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Ooh, don't you love that? My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear and rejoice. He says, oh, magnify the Lord. He said, well, y'all join. Just don't make me do it by myself. He said, join me in magnifying God because God has been good. He said, it doesn't matter that my life is in dire straits. He said, I'm going to praise him. He said, and I want you all to join with me in praising and worshiping God. Why? He said, because God has been so good to me. Anybody in here had God to be so good that you really know? You know how you be in that spot where you say, Lord, I need you to deliver and God comes through for you. And see, there has to be a time where you recognize and come to the place. And that's that mental posture of whereby you recognize that God has done. And you just raise your hand and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you. You give him the glory. I know everybody's not as expressive and don't have all the emotive aspects. But at some point, there has to be the place whereby your mind connects with your mouth. And cause you to give him the glory that he deserves. They're here and they're ready to leave. And Pharaoh calls Moses and Aaron to him. He's just fed up. When his son dies, he's fed up. He called Moses and Aaron and he tells them, 
I mean, Exodus 12, 31, he said that night, rise up, get out from among my people. He says, it's time for y'all to get up and go. He said, y'all got to go. Like having company stayed too long. Both you and the sons of Israel, go, he says, look, imperative of force, worship the Lord as you have said. He says, get out of here and go worship him. He says, leave. Look at verse 32, watch this. Take both your flock, your herds, as you have said, and go and bless me also. Look what he says at the end of that verse. He says, I want you to leave. He says, but on your way out, he said, bless me. It's Pharaoh talking. Why would hard-hearted, rebellious, idolatrous, pagan, polytheistic, Pharaoh asked Moses and Aaron to bless him because Pharaoh has seen the evidence of God. Y'all see that? Look, look. Y'all ain't catching it. Pharaoh saw the signs and wonder. He saw the water turn, turn to blood. He saw the staff turn into a snake. He saw the boils. He saw the flies. He saw the locusts. He saw the first son die. And when he saw that, he says, God is truly God. The God of Moses and Aaron, even though I don't worship him, he's truly God. And he says, y'all bless me on your way out. Let me tell you something. I don't care what your friends, your neighbors, your family members say. But when God is blessing and moving in your life, they see it. They may never tell you. They may never bless you and say, I see the change in your life. I see how God is maturing you. I see how God has grown you up. I see how he's changed your character. They may never tell you, but they see it. And secretly, they want to say, bless me. Because God has a God who always let people know that I'm the one who's doing the blessing. And all God wants from us is, is to raise a hand every now and then and say, Lord, I worship you. I praise you. I give you glory because, God, you are the one who's doing this in my life. God wants us to worship him. Because God is worthy. God is the one who does this in our lives. Moses and Aaron couldn't make Pharaoh say these words, but God could. Why does he do it? Because God wants to make certain that he, he alone is the one that is worship. Impact who you're worshiping this morning. Who you're worshiping. Who, who's in that number one spot? God does this so that he might get the glory. And God is doing it in our lives so that he might get the glory. And impact, I'm challenging you this morning. Those who watch us by live stream know our God is a good, gracious, loving God, but God wants us to worship him. He wants us to attribute the worth and the value to him that he so richly deserves. Somebody sitting here and saying, Roche, how do I worship God? How, how do I cultivate this lifestyle of worship? And I want you to hear me. Listen, I don't want you to think I'm speaking condescending to you or speaking low to you but I want you to hear what I'm listen to what I'm going to say because we all have to understand and comprehend this so often we come and we want some heavy word we want a deep dissertation a great thesis statement about how we get this stuff done and God makes certain he makes it simplistic for us the first way we begin to worship God is this every morning you wake up Stay with me. Every morning when your eyes open, that is an occasion for you to say, thank you. Every morning. I'm, I'm, I'm just talking about when you wake. Your mind should remind you, you didn't wake yourself. That alarm clock, sometimes it, may not, it might not work. But there is a God who reaches down and touches us. Shakes us. And the way you begin to cultivate the attitude of worship is recognizing mentally that it was not me, but it was God. And when you say, thank you, Lord, you are beginning to cultivate worship. 
when you go in there to brush, shower, thank you for the water, Lord. It didn't have to be. It could have been outside in a creek. Didn't, didn't have to be in this home. You provide it. When you make it to the table and you begin to, to ingest oatmeal, whatever you eat, bacon, grits, egg, and ham, whatever you are eating, listen, thank you, Lord, for your provision because, Lord, it didn't have to be in the pantry. Worship is about recognizing the one who provided it for you. Your mind has to connect there and then verbally you say it. That's the pronouncement of the praise. But you got to see the one that gave it to you first. And many of us, we have become so indifferent to the things that we have that we miss the one that provides it for us. Let me tell you something, especially in our woodlands context. Yeah, this is a very, very affluent city. Very, very affluent. And if you're not careful, you will start believing that you provided the protection and all the accoutrements that you have. And there needs to be those gentle reminders every morning that our Lord, our God is the one who provides this for us. Yeah. When you jump in that pool, you need to thank him for it. When you jump on your golf cart to ride down the street to go get your mail, go to the country club, you need to remind him he gave it to you. There's nothing wrong with being, hey, enjoy it. Enjoy it. But I want to make certain that in our affluence that we never forget the one who provided it for us. Are you all with me? Because the same God that gives is the same God that can take away. And it doesn't take long. God, God wants us to worship him. Why does he want us to worship him? Because he's worthy. In the conversation, he's worthy. The way you cultivate an attitude and lifestyle of worship is by daily recognizing that God is the one who is really providing everything that you have. Let me tell you something. Life provides so many distractions to try to keep you from seeing that. But every day you have to remind yourself, God, you have done this and I thank you for it. Our impact fact for today is this. Learn to worship the Lord in every season of life because the Lord is worthy. Oh, he's worthy. Anybody know God is worthy? If you know God to be a worthy God, let's give him a hand clap of praise. He is a good God. He's so worthy to be praised. We thank God for his grace. We thank him for his mercy, for his compassion, for his kindness. And we recognize there is none like him. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for today. And Lord, we want to continue to cultivate this mindset of worship. Lord, there are many of us who are in here today, Lord, we are in a delayed pattern. All of us, Lord God, cannot be in the place of celebration and joy. And for those, Lord, who are in the delayed pattern, I pray for them right now, Lord, that they would recognize that their connection is coming, that you're going to take them to where they need to be. But in that season that they may learn to worship you. Lord, for those of us who are in a place of joy and we're celebrating, excited about what you're doing, Lord, help us, Lord God, to weep with those who weep. And to recognize, Lord, everything that we have is because you are a good God and you've given it to us. For every person, Lord, whatever season of life, I pray right now you whisper to them and remind them of your faithfulness, your love, your compassion, your kindness. And may they, Lord, look unto you. And for whatever you do, we will give you praise and glory. We love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.